Well, hello, everyone. I don't do theories too often, not full-blown ones anyway, but a few weeks ago, a lovely new friend named Shara asked me about a specific moment in the show, and both of us have been researching and finding connections ever since. That moment is when Crowley's wings turn noticeably gray, and Neil has confirmed that this does indeed occur, so what are the implications of this color shift? As often happens to me with this kind of thing, once I actually started looking and Shara started looking with me, we found that what seemed to be a question with a fairly simple and straightforward answer was so much more. So, let's get into it. Crowley was an angel once. All of the demons were. We know a bit about the timeline. Before the Earth, the Garden, and Adam and Eve were created, there was a timeless period of universal planning and creation. Then there was a rebellion that turned into a war. The rebels lost the war and were cast out. This is collectively known as the Fall. We might ask, why the rebellion? Why the war? Why did the angels fall? But we, as the viewers of the show and readers of the book, might be more interested in one individual in particular, so let's reframe that question. Why did Crowley fall? In the beginning, Crowley and Aziraphale both have the same type and color of wings. In Western art and literature, particularly Abrahamic and biblical lore, white has a long association with purity, divinity, and, most importantly, innocence. Milk Visual, the VFX studio for both seasons of Good Omens, initially planned to model Crowley's wings after those of a bat. Neil stepped in and specified that Crowley and Aziraphale have the same wing design, just with Crowley's being black. So the VFX department used swan wings as their models for the gorgeous feathery creations we see on screen. Although swans don't have much biblical symbolism, they do have cultural significance. In nature, swans usually mate for life. In Western art and literature, they're often used to represent grace, beauty, fidelity, and commitment. Their loyalty to their mates is nearly legendary, so much so that the image of two swans with their necks entwined in the shape of a heart is widely recognized as a symbol of love, which makes this image even more beautifully fitting. Bats, on the other hand, as nocturnal creatures, have a deep-seated association with darkness, uncleanliness, and specifically with biblical demons. By having both Crowley and Aziraphale's wings remain modeled on swans, the audience gets a visual shorthand that in the Good Omens universe, angels and demons are fundamentally the same. They really are from the same stock. And on top of that, we get the subtextual message of lifelong partners. Well, this is all very well, you might be thinking, but what has all this got to do with the fall? I'm getting there, I promise. Neil has noted that Crowley does have control over the appearance of his wings. He chooses to keep his angel wing appearance just with the color black. But this initial change of color is clearly not a conscious change on his part. So what exactly happened here to cause this change, the very beginning of his saunter vaguely downwards? Initially in their heavenly encounter, Crowley is full of innocent joy, gleeful at the prospect of seeing his hard work on the design phase of the universe come to fruition. His perspective is untarnished. When Aziraphale reveals the details of Earth and that God's plan is to shut the entire universe down in only about 6,000 years, Crowley is crestfallen and extremely confused. It doesn't make any sense to him. He's been working on the detailed design of stars and nebulas and the laws of physics for who knows how long and had never even heard of this Earth or the people that were being designed to inhabit it. He listened very attentively as Aziraphale explained that all of his work, the very purpose for which he was created, and something he very clearly loves, is really nothing but fancy wallpaper for humans. And the majority of it won't even be seen before it's all shut down again. It is, to Crowley and to the audience, recognized as absurd. You can see here where Crowley's feathers actually get ruffled up. He suggests Earth should be more centrally located, at least, and Aziraphale takes a bit of offense on the Almighty's behalf. Aziraphale is a rule follower and doesn't seem to understand what Crowley is so upset about. At first, Aziraphale's pushing back, nervous but firm, trying to get Crowley to sort of fall back in line, but Crowley's having none of it. He says, Well, you know, if I was the one running it all, I'd like it if someone asked questions. Fresh point of view. At this point, Aziraphale looks away and then looks all around. His eyes are wide and his breathing is shaky. Unaware, Crowley continues questioning the wisdom of the Almighty's plan. You can't just create a universe, run it for a few thousand years and then stop. The music here changes to a very ominous, drawn-out tone. 
Aziraphale clearly starts to panic. He stutters and finally blurts out, I like the pinky blue bit in the corner of the, the nebula. Yeah, it's very, um, yeah. Then, looking genuinely scared, advises Crowley not to get into any trouble. But Crowley seems to have made up his mind. And thanks for your advice. I wouldn't worry, though. How much trouble can I get into just for asking a few questions? Here, we can see the wing color shift, and we hear a tolling bell. The tone of the bell to the audience is an auditory clue I'd like to get into real quick. Bells, when bright and lively, can signal an awakening or joyous occasion, but this kind of somber-toned bell is associated with something very specific. Death. Not a literal death, much like the graying of his wings, which is a visual tarnishing of his purity. What the audience is meant to infer here is the death of his innocence. But innocence lost is just the beginning. Although questioning God's plan might be his first step in his long saunter downwards, it certainly wasn't his last. Freely they stood who stood, and fell who fell. Neil has clearly stated that Crowley is not a reliable narrator when it comes to his own fall. When asked by a fan if Crowley was good before the fall, Neil replied, not as good as he likes to maintain and nowhere near as bad as heaven would like to imagine. So from this statement, I think we can deduce that Crowley's comments about his own fall are not outright lies or even factually incorrect, just incomplete and probably played down. When he says, I didn't mean to fall. I just hung around the wrong people. He seems to be trying to downplay his own role, but also underline the fact that he didn't mean for whatever it was he did to result in falling. It wasn't a single act. It was a series of choices, one leading to the next. When speaking to God in his apartment, he says, I only ever ask questions. That's all it took to be a demon in the old days. But we know it went further than simply asking questions. That was just the beginning. In season one, when he thinks Aziraphale is gone and he's alone and drunk in the bar and talking to himself about the fall, the only person he could even be lying to in this scene is himself. Of course, he must be downplaying what happened, but let's try and translate. I never asked to be a demon. True, he never did. None of them got to make this choice. Whatever they did, they didn't know the possible consequence was demonhood. How could they? There wasn't even such a thing yet. I just mind my own business one day and then... Ah, oh, look at here, it's Lucifer and the guys. From this, we can infer that he was friendly with Lucifer and the guys. Sounds like Satan had probably been gathering up any ill-contented angels and befriending them for a while. I... Food hasn't been that good lately. Didn't have anything on for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> this is a funny line but also indicates that he was discontented with something. You can bet it wasn't just the food. He's really downplaying it here, though, lying even to himself. But he wasn't happy with the way things were being run. Next thing, I'm uh, doing a million light year freestyle dive into a pool of boiling sulfur. This is just sad. Whatever he did, this memory is clearly very painful. But we know he's skipping a few steps here. He says nothing about the Great War, even though he admits to Furfur that he remembers going into battle. What happened between hanging out with Lucifer and the guys and falling? Although all of these statements don't entirely add up, I think they're a good starting point for figuring out what happened, what he's leaving out. So what else can we deduce about the fall and Crowley's views on God from other scenes and events in the show, things not directly narrated to us by Crowley? At the end of season two, the Metatron gives Crowley a very dark and frankly disturbing look, underscored by dramatic music. There is some unpleasant history here. Just a short while later, after hearing that Crowley won't be coming to heaven, he remarks, Ah, well, always did want to go his own way. I'm not certain, but I think this indicates that the Metatron was around in the beginning, before the fall. In 1941, Furfur seems to expect Crowley to recognize him from their time together, and Crowley does remember going into battle, so we know he participated in the fight just before the fall. A companion to Owls has a couple of really notable moments. First, Aziraphale believes that by lying to protect Job's children, he has become a fallen angel. Crowley seems to find this amusing. Although certainly Aziraphale would be in trouble for this lie, it's not along the lines of what caused the fall. 
This indicates that Aziraphale is at least somewhat unclear on the details himself, even though we know he also fought in the war. Earlier in that same episode, I think is where we find the big clue. When Gabriel tells Sidis that her children are dead, she says that if that's true, she will curse God's name. Crowley comes swinging in like a superhero and stops her from actually doing it. If my children are dead, then I will curse God. Whoa! Whoa, 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 whoa. That never ends well. Hmm. I think Crowley might be telling us something. Good Omens is, in many ways, a modern reframing of biblical stories and themes. We know that it's mostly drawn on Genesis and Revelations, but also in Season 2 on Job, and a general knowledge of the Bible. In addition, there seems to be influence from classical literature and art, such as Milton's Paradise Lost, which was written in the mid to late 17th century, and Dante's Divine Comedy, which was written in the very early 14th century, not Crowley's favorite period of human history. Another influential work is The Fall of the Damned, which uses themes of light versus dark to incredible effect. It was painted by Peter Paul Rubens in the early 1600s and displays a scene wherein all sinners and fallen angels are swept into the depths of hell. The classical influence is unsurprising considering how strongly these works shaped Western culture and how modern people think about things like angels and hell. Neil has also made it very clear that he relies on old myths and legends quite heavily in his work. When someone recently wished him a happy public domain day and then told Neil that about half of his work wouldn't exist without these works in the public domain, Neil corrected him only to say, half? More like all of it. So let's take a casual stroll through these classic literary and artistic works and see what we can see. Biblical angels aren't described in the way we generally imagine angels today. Biblical angels are, generally speaking, much more alien and terrifying to behold. Our modern angels, beautiful to behold with golden halos and grand wings, have come to us over the centuries as Christianity absorbed pieces of other myths, such as the Greek god Nike. Artistic interpretations have changed with the shifting tides of culture. A more beautiful and relatable-looking angel could more easily get a message across to the post-Renaissance audience when culture took a hard turn towards humanism. And the same holds true of demons. Instead of being portrayed as monstrous, they're given a much more human form as time marched forward. Paradise Lost portrays Lucifer not as the villain of the story, but as a sort of romantic anti-hero. Some literary historians even consider the Lucifer of Paradise Lost to be the first true Byronic hero, predating Lord Byron's work by a good 140 years. This famous quote, "'Better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven,' comes from that work and embodies Lucifer's discontent with the leadership and how things are being run and decided. Indeed, this line has a very give me liberty or give me death sort of vibe. Lucifer and presumably the angels that are following him simply want the freedom to go their own way. They didn't ask to be demons. Biblical accounts of the fall vary, though all of course paint Lucifer and his fallen angels as the bad guys, for instance... In Revelations, we're given a fairly simple account of the fall with almost no context. This particular telling only gives us a very bare bones and one-sided story of the fall, and certainly we don't see why some angels followed Lucifer or what sins they committed aside from hanging around the wrong guy. Matthew 18.12 states, But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. While in Peter 2.4, we get a very poetic and vivid description. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, outing them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. We might take this to mean that Crowley is likewise chained in darkness, chained because he knows the truth, but in Good Omens fashion, the biblical meaning is completely subverted. In Good Omens, the more knowledge the angels and demons gain, the more truth they become aware of, the closer they all inch to true freedom. Crowley tells us repeatedly that he is unforgivable, but what does that mean? Over and over we see angels and people sin against God and they don't gain that status unforgivable. Gabriel blatantly nopes the second coming and pieces out with the demon. He never even addressed God, however, he's just doing his own thing. Aziraphale gives away his flaming sword and then avoids telling the truth when God asks him a direct question about it. 
Aziraphale also told a lie to Gabriel about Job's children and did thwart the will of God, though it is absolutely notable that he never really seemed to accept that those deaths would have been the will of God. It's like killing innocent children to win a bet with Satan. I, I don't think that is what God wants. And he never holds God accountable, only himself. I lied to thwart the will of God. Likewise, Job questions God directly and is not punished, but of course, what made Job righteous in God's eyes was that even when she was punishing him and he didn't know why, he blamed himself, not God, much like Aziraphale. And how sunk in sin must I be not only to deserve all this, but not even to know why. So if asking questions isn't unforgivable and lying to thwart the will of God isn't unforgivable, what is? I think there's an idea in modern culture that God will forgive anything if you repent. But biblically speaking, that simply isn't true. There is an unforgivable sin. And if you're out there and listening to this and have some religious trauma, I apologize. This next bit might be difficult. If you need to skip it, there's another timestamp down in the description. What is the unforgivable sin? The one that once committed, you can never come back from. Therefore, I tell you, people will be forgiven for every sin and blasphemy, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Matthew 12, 30 through 12, 32. This is also known as the sin unto death and is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. But what is it? For an unforgivable act, it's not well defined. The definition has changed through history and varies by sect and by locale. Modern theologians still don't agree on exactly what thought or act constitutes this unforgivable sin. If we want to draw any meaningful conclusions, we're going to have to go take a look at how Good Omens specifically has framed God and the very idea of sin. It's a fine line, but when Aziraphale defies God to save Job's children, he does so sincerely believing, or at least hoping in the end, that he's still actually doing God's will. He never expresses any sort of contempt or rejection of her or her plan, despite being shown the bet she made with Satan. Aziraphale still recognizes God as the highest authority in the universe. In all his time, even when he defied her will, he maintained his faith in her and in the great ineffable plan. As discussed earlier, Job also maintains his faith in God's plan as well, but his wife, Sidis, was on the verge of cursing the name of God, rejecting her and her great and or ineffable plan. In my opinion, as my very best guess, this is the unforgivable sin in Good Omens. When Crowley learned that all of his hard work would be dismantled in just 6,000 years, his wings were tarnished gray, and his innocence was lost. But in its place, over time, he has gained both knowledge and wisdom. The Bible may portray this exchange of innocence for knowledge as a chain to the truth, even as a kind of death. Crowley's current wings, his gorgeous black swan wings, tell us something very different. Although he has fallen, although God cast him into the outer darkness, the core him is fundamentally unchanged. Though he might deny it, he retains his inner beauty, his compassion, his capacity for grace and love. And yet he did fall, so now that I've laid out all the pieces, let's see if we can manage to put them together into something coherent. We know for a fact that the first step on this long saunter down was asking questions. We know that Aziraphale seemed to be clued in that that was a dangerous path to tread. The wrath of God is a very real thing, right from the beginning. We know that Crowley did hang around Lucifer in the guise. We know that in most lore, Lucifer was prideful and thought he could rival God. So based on everything Crowley said in both seasons, based on Aziraphale's clear fear of and yet maintained faith in God, and based on Crowley's reaction to Sidis almost cursing God, I have a fairly simple theory about why Crowley fell. Out of his love for the stars, and yes, also out of pride because he's a proud being, Crowley rejected God's plans and therefore rejected God. I think it's likely he did curse her. Wouldn't it be slightly funny if he called her an idiot? But he would have cursed her for planning to destroy all of the beauty of creation, an entire universe, and countless unborn stars after just 6,000 years. I think that this is the blasphemy, the unforgivable sin that he's committed. It seems Lucifer and a number of other angels were also not happy with the great plan, 
They lost their faith in the plan and therefore in God. And so they rebelled against God and started a war, which is, as Neil said, worse than how Crowley paints himself, but still much less evil than heaven claims. Because really, as in Paradise Lost, it's quite relatable. In a nutshell, I think that for this, for loving the thing he was created to do and refusing to accept its destruction in a mere 6,000 years as a good idea, he was cast down. Perhaps this seems too simple, but I do think that sometimes for good storytelling, simple is best. The emotional groundwork for all of this has already been well established. Pretty much the entire fandom wants to see the fall. We expect to see some details about it in Season 3. It's possible that Crowley defied the Metatron to his face. The enmity there seems pretty personal. How will we see the fall as a flashback from Crowley? Will we see it from an omniscient perspective? Will Aziraphale see it in his new position in heaven? The latter seems likely to me, because what broke Crowley's faith was the threat of destruction aimed at something he loved. Look at you, you're gorgeous. I think it makes sense that what will finally break Aziraphale's faith loose from its moorings is the exact same thing. But hey, that's just a theory. A good omens theory. Sorry, I'm sorry. I had to do it just once in honor of Matt Pat. While I've got you here, and we're talking about theories, I want to make it clear that I am never married to my theories. By that, I mean, although I'm doing my very, very best to put the clues together, if when season three comes out, every single theory I've ever made is proven wrong, I won't take it personally. I won't even see it as a failure. The goal is having fun in the fandom we love, and I'm having fun. We're getting season three. That's a win. We're also getting this magical time between season two and three. This is a really, really special time in a fandom. We get to analyze and theorize and anticipate the amazing ending headed our way. So I'd like to encourage everyone to just enjoy it. Once season three arrives, we'll look back on these years in between with fond memories. This brief period of not knowing, of guessing and eagerly awaiting, exists in a very narrow window of time. Thanks for spending some of that precious time here with me. You're amazing. And if you did enjoy this theory, you might enjoy one of these older theories up here. So tell me in the comments what you think about the fall. Do you think I'm right? Do you think I'm mad as a hatter? Do you think it's much more complicated than all of this? What are your theories about the fall? Do you like my new little intro? I hope so. I couldn't use the Good Omens title sequence as my opener forever. This opening was written and performed by the wonderfully talented Misha. Misha, if you're listening, thank you so much. I love it and I couldn't be happier. I hope you keep creating. I actually managed to put out a little outtakes video last week for my patrons. You can head over to Patreon and check that out for free. If you'd like to support what I'm doing here and you want to see some notes, Easter eggs, maybe more little things like those outtakes, you can join or just check out the stuff that's there for free. Thank you to all of my patrons. And don't forget to check out Discord. It's practically buzzing with activities from Trivia Night to the Crepe Cooking event. There's something for everyone. I do have to mention Good Omens Got True Talents before I go because I really, really want the talent show to be a success for all of you. If it could become an annual thing, that would be so much fun. You might notice the name changed. That's because I didn't want to get sued by Simon Cowell. And thank you to Brigitte for helping me change the name. Entries are starting to come in, but I've heard from a number of folks that the deadline is a little tight. I realize now that two months wasn't enough time, and some people have big projects in mind. Lesson learned for next year. To encourage as much participation as possible, I'll be extending the submission deadline to February 17th. That's almost an extra week. The show dates are remaining the same. Congratulations to Fran L. for winning the trivia contest. Yay! Whew, that was a long video, folks. Thanks for sticking with me to the end. Well, I guess I have rambled on at you long enough for today. So as always, my lovely, lovely viewers, thanks for watching. <laughs>